Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I'm Rick Whitaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce my great friend, Richard Howard. Richard, for those of you who don't know, probably all of you do, was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and is a graduate of Columbia University, where he studied under Mark Van Doren, and where he is now professor of professional practice in the writing division of the School of the Arts. This lecture today is part of a course at Columbia, which I'll explain at the end of my introduction. After studying at the Sorbonne in the early 1950s, Richard Howard had a brief early career as a lexicographer. He soon turned his attention to poetry and criticism and won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for his 1969 collection, Untitled Subjects. He was awarded the Penn Translation Prize in 1976 for his translation of Sauron's A Short History of Decay, and the National Book Award for his 1983 translation of Baudelaire's Les Fleurs du Mal. Richard Howard was a longtime poetry editor of the Paris Review. He has also received the Academy of Arts and Letters Literary Award and a MacArthur Fellowship a former chancellor of the, Academy of, Art, uh, of the Am Academy of American Poets. He was previously university professor of English at the University of Houston, and before that, professor of comparative literature at the University of Cincinnati. He served as poet laureate of, poet laureate of the state of New York from 1994 to 1997. In 1982, Howard was named a Chevalier of l'Ordre National du Mérite by the government of France. He has published nearly 20 volumes of poetry, several works of prose, and has translated books by, among many others, Roland Barthes, Simone de Beauvoir, André Breton, Michel Foucault, André Gide, Claude Simon, Stendhal, Charles de Gaulle, Maurice Maeterlinck, Marc Fumaroli, Albert Camus, and surely his most popular translation, The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Each semester, Professor Howard offers a lecture course with a different theme and reading list. The theme this semester was introduced in the following way by Professor Howard. There is an old convention which shows an epic preference for rhetorical splendor. In recent centuries, a subsequent convention has created a series of more circumspect masterpieces in prose and even verse, our lectures will discuss this new literature of restraint, which, more elliptical than profuse, will be treated individually in works by Elizabeth Bishop, Madame de Lafayette, Benjamin Constant, Ivan Turgenev, Gustav Flaubert, Leo Tolstoy, Vislava Simborska, Edith Wharton, Jane Austen, Willa Cather, Colette, Virginia Woolf, Sylvia Townsend Warner, and Italo Calvino. Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Howard. Good. He's turned me on. Thanks for coming, and uh, and I and I like the idea that there is, that you have some notion of what the, the, a course of such works might be just by by hearing the names. About twenty five years ago, I think uh, Italo Calvino was. Um, a celebrated and admired figure. I don't think anybody knows who he is anymore in this country. Uh, you all do, and that's very gratifying. There are a few things I want to say about him uh, before I talk about this particular work. Difficult Love, which is what I asked my students to read. And, and I, I, we had extra copies, and I passed them around if you, if you want copies of it. Um, Calvino arrived at a point where he 
where any work that he did was the work uh, that he would write no matter what. It was always going to be a Calvino enterprise of the same sort. This was not the case when he began. He began as a, well, I, I, I think I should perhaps say something about his father and mother, that kind of thing. Oh, he was born uh, seven years before I was, in, oddly enough, in Cuba, where his parents, uh, his father was an agronomist and spent a number of years in tropical countries, mostly Latin America. And his mother, uh, a native of Sardinia, was also a scientist, uh, a botanist. And uh, uh, there's an older brother uh, uh, who uh, became uh, something of a botanist himself. But uh, there was um, no literary uh, impulse handed to him by the family. That, in fact, there was, it was, his literary impulse was, was rather, uh, I think, a reversal of the, of the, the scientific uh, uh, background. For instance, Calvino was uh, instructed where, at whatever schooling he had in Italy, uh, to, to make sure uh, that there was no religious uh, training of any kind. Uh, he actually enrolled, though, in the agriculture department of the University of Turin, uh, lasting there only until the first examinations. Uh, when when the Germans occupied Liguria and the rest of northern Italy during the World War II, um, Calvino and his 16-year-old brother evaded the fascist draft and joined the, per the partisans. And that's when he began writing, chiefly about his wartime experiences. He published his first stories and uh, at the same time uh, resumed his university studies, transferring from agriculture to literature. And uh, it was at this time that he wrote his first novel, which has been translated into English. I should point out that he has been extraordinarily fortunate in having one of the finest uh, translators from any language that America has, uh, has had encountered, uh, William Weaver, uh, who until quite recently was, uh, I would say, the, the most uh, remarkable and uh, valuable translator in any language. Uh, in our of our of our country, um, uh, uh, Bill Weaver is now dead, and no longer uh, the enormous list, for instance, of his produ pr pr productions uh, is such that. Uh, one simply, he, 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 it seems to have translated all of Calvino. He, did, he hasn't because uh, he died only a few years ago, but the work uh, was so plentiful that uh, there was more to be done and, and there are other excellent translators who are, are doing it. 
but Weaver has done most of it, and that is a great blessing for us as readers. Um, the entire uh, range, uh, and that's the right word to use about this writer, uh, what is uh, within the uh, achievement of William Weaver, and, and one, one is terribly grateful uh, to the gods uh, for uh, allowing this to have happened. It really means that uh, one has a kind of delight in the work, which is uh, an extra uh, a bonus. There are very few Italian translators uh, of uh, modern works uh, who, who have performed this, this kind of service uh, in, the, in the way that Weaver has for Calvino, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to make, make something of it, because it's, it uh, is really why someone can stand in front of you and talk about Calvino as what I'm eager to say is that he is a, a, a thrilling and major figure uh, not only of Italian literature, but of modern literature in the West. And uh, I feel that he is, something has happened to our uh, arrangements about presenting this figure any further. There, there should be a, 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 an enormous uh, one volume uh, work that will have uh, 10 or 15 of his yeah, almost always brief works, but together so that one can have a single volume and, and, and have that, that hasn't happened. Uh, and one must go through the fact that from the first, from his first book was, uh, well, it was really his second book, but it's the one that's known is called The, the Path to the Nest of, of Spiders, or path to the spider's nest, um, and uh, it was translated uh, first in uh, 57, 10 years after it was written, um, and then, then uh, and it was still a, uh, a wartime uh, production, and uh, with something of the uh, of the of the communist uh, enthusiasm for uh, a certain kind of uh, intensity uh, that uh, by in, in, within 10 years. Um, and Calvino, who reveled in the fact that there, his name was, uh, his first name was Italo, and his family name was actually Calvin. And uh, he, he liked, uh, when he came here to this country, he, he used uh, and, and gave lectures. He, he would start by saying that, that he was a Calvinist. And, uh, and he, it was something that he enjoyed. Uh, and, then, and then he pointed out that there was a contradiction uh, between his first name and his second name and so forth. It worked uh, for him that way. Uh, he, when he came here to do the Harvard uh, series that uh, so many uh, European writers have uh, spoken, done, and he, and he died 
while he was preparing the, the series uh, of lectures, and uh, which is, I think, called, I have it here somewhere, Essays and Other Writings, yeah. Yes, six memo memos uh, uh, for the next milestone or millennium. Six memos for the next millennium uh, was was the the text of the that he was to give as the uh, uh, at Harvard uh, and was prevented from giving it by by a, a cerebral hemorrhage. Um, the, it was the Charles Eliot Norton lectures. So. That's what I was straining for. Um, but he discovered uh, a, uh, a, a visionary uh, system uh, that, that replaced communism, uh, which uh, had uh, disappointed him thoroughly. And, and that, that, that system was the imagination itself. It, it was. Uh, the, the, a great fund of Italian achievement, uh, a folk achievement, which uh, was collecting, which he himself collected and edited, and, and a great volume of uh, called Italian fables, and uh, he, that was redone several times. Uh, it was fa sometimes called fantastic tales and so forth, racconti fantastici, uh, mostly from the 18th century, but, but summing up work that had been done uh, over several earlier centuries. And uh, I don't think anything of it, of uh, uh, Italo Calvino, that has been published since has ever been untouched by the by, by Italian fables. On the contrary, he, he is uh, he is the son and child of, of uh, the fabulous uh, impulse, and uh, even the work that we are that I, I specifically want to talk about today is. Uh, is still within uh, the range of Italian fables, and it, even even its title, uh, the notion "Difficult Loves," uh, and and there are eight of them, and uh, they have these extraordinary uh, notions of the adventure. Each one, the adventure of the soldier, the bather, the clerk, the photographer, the traveler, the reader, the nearsighted man, and finally, and I think um, with a certain compulsive uh, summing up, the poet. Uh, and. Uh, the poet is the shortest one, and I think I'll end by reading it entire to you, or speaking it to you. <laughs> the little book, Difficult Loves, is as good as anything Calvino ever wrote. It, uh, it is a kind of fabulous, uh, gathering, and it, uh, it works as well as anything in, in describing his, uh, his gift uh, or his, his impulse as a writer. It, it came to, it was, I think, it, it was by 1947 that uh, such things uh, were pretty much uh, 
established and finished, and uh, it was possible for Calvino to be the writer he is from that, that early point onward, and uh, it never, I think, left him. Um, I'm myself absolutely confused by the uh, fact that most people have not read Calvino or, have, or even know who he is in this country. And uh, I think he has a, a, a larger and more uh, satisfactory European reputation. But uh, he was, uh, many, um, because of Bill Weaver's labors, much of his work is available still for us here, and I urge you to, to examine it. He, I, I'm convinced that he is uh, uh, one of the, the authors that we uh, can uh, rely on for uh, the, the, the highest literary satisfaction, and I'm very, very happy to be, be promoting him here. Um, the idea that any work of an author is as good as any other is not a, a, a I don't think we're supposed to think that way about, about literary productions. Uh, but it, I, I believe it is important or, or correct to say that, that that is really true of Calvino, that there, there is not this sense that all of his efforts arrived in certain works. I think we all have preferences, those of us who've read a great many of his works. And uh, there was a long period uh, when I thought Invisible Cities was his, his finest work. Uh, and then I, I realized that there is no finest work of Calvino. It, there are Calvino works, and they are all, <coughs> they are all of a, of a, uh, an achievement uh, that is uh, singular and uh, valuable, uh, but not necessarily any one better than, than another. And, that, and I think that uh, it's not in uh, our evaluations of literature that is not really a, a popular or a, a, an ordinary way of thinking of things, but I, 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 I believe it is the case. Um, he would start with an image or a figure and then add another to it and another and you and he got uh, eventually he would come to something like difficult loves uh, uh, and there are eight of them and and that becomes the the uh, the form uh, and uh, it, it it worked for uh, him again, very near the end of his life, and 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 extreme production. I just want to run through the titles of the main From the, between the path to the nest of spiders, then the first of the fabulous works, which is called the Cloven Viscount, uh, and then comes uh, the big volume of Italian fables, uh, and then uh, the Baron in the Trees, and. Uh, the non-existent night, K-N-I-G-H-T, and then uh, <clears throat> M 
Marco Valdo or The Season in the City, Smog, these are all being translated by William Weaver by this time, um, and a, an extraordinary volume called Cosmic Comics that I recommend very highly. Uh, and there are several volumes that are very similar with titles uh, that make that clear. And then comes The Castle of Crossed Destinies. These are all William Weaver translations. Difficult Loves. Uh, the Inv Invisible Cities, that's 1972. Uh, if on a Winter's Night, a Traveler. Another work that is often thought to be a favorite, if not superior, uh, is Palomar. In English, it's called Mr. Palomar, also translated by Bill Weaver. And then there are um, the translate. There are other works, including uh, essays and other writings. Uh, an interpretation of the Orlando Furioso of Ariosto. Uh, there is nothing epic about the imagination of Italo Calvino, but he has no trouble in finding um, the key to epic, uh, in, in uh, especially in Italian works, and he. he by 1970, he has made a kind of an of ultimate interpretation of, of Ariosto that is just extraordinary. Uh, there are his own versions of the, all the fantastic tales. Um, there is a wonderful essay called Science and Metaphor in the Works of Galileo. Uh, that was given as lectures uh, at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes in Paris. Um, the, he gave one lecture here uh, informally uh, at the Institute for Humanities in March 83 uh, called uh, The Writer and the Unwritten Word. Uh, and then there was the six, the six memos for the next millennium and uh, originally prepared for the Charles o Elliot Norton lectures and the essays on fables and so forth. And several uh, autobiographical works, even one uh, as late as 1994. Uh, I think it was translated in 2003 uh, uh, called uh, uh, The Hermit in Paris about living in Paris, his living in Paris. He did many other things, translations, he did librettos for operas, a couple of plays, uh, French translations of Raymond Queneau, another uh, fellow Fabulous, and um, the, I, the work it put together would, 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 is enormously voluminous, and yet it, it is, I, I believe it is perfectly possible uh, and perfectly appropriate to say that any single work 
uh, will do as a representative uh, accomplishment of this writer. Uh, and that is not going to be, uh, there's not, you, you won't have to suddenly say, no, no, but there is something else that is achieved in one of the other books which is not found here. Th that, that he isn't that kind of writer. And uh, I, it, that's why I, I urged my students to read uh, Calvino's Difficult Loves, uh, uh, translated by William Weaver, with a couple of the other difficult loves besides the eight that are given in this little handout uh, were translated by uh, Archibald Colquhoun. Uh, but um, again, it, it was Bill Weaver who, uh, who took, took the, 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 the major hand in, in bringing this work as so many of the others of Calvino to us in English, and it's a, it's a, a damn good thing. Um, the Difficult Loves begins, uh, the first one is uh, The Soldier, The Adventure of a Soldier, and uh, his adventure it persists or consists entirely of uh, an afternoon in a train in a compartment uh, in which a, a lady came and sat down, tall and buxom, next to Private Tomagra. She must have been a widow from the provinces to judge by her dress and her veil. The dress was black silk, appropriate for prolonged mourning, but uh, with useless frills and furbelows, and the veil went all around her face, falling from the brim of a massive old-fashioned hat. And then the, the, the story begins, this story, the first difficult love, begins um, with the fact that the lady enters the compartment of the train, and there are plenty of seats within the compartment, and uh, she sits down next to uh, private uh, Tamagra, Tamagra, and uh, with, with a considerable uh, closeness, uh, uh, intimacy. Uh, and uh, he really is somewhat flummoxed at this situation, doesn't know what to do. And the adventure of a soldier is, 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 a, a, is, is what he does do. And uh, it, uh, it, it, it follows. It's maybe 10 or 12 pages. I'll just read you the last lines of it. It is the least um, adventurous and uh, when Tamago stood up and beneath him the widow remained with her clear, stern gaze, and then he gives a parenthesis, she had blue eyes, with her hat and veil still squarely on her head, and the train never stopped its shrill whistling through the fields and outside those endless rows of grapevines went on and the rain that throughout the journey had tirelessly streaked the panes now resumed with new violence. He had again a brief spurt of fear, thinking how he, 
Private Tamano, Timago had been so daring. That's, that's the first of the episodes, the adventure. And uh, they become increasingly vivid and uh, uh, all encom encompassing until finally, uh, well, we'll, I think I, I'll make clear what the, the adventure of the poet is. But uh, these are all difficult loves. And as I say, there, there are eight of them, and they have that, they, they have no account of them aside from the fact that they are the the adventure of, as he says, the soldier, the bather, the clerk, the photographer, the traveler, the reader, th those two are perhaps um, the most, uh, the nearest to Calvino's heart because he was a considerable traveler and reader. Uh, and then the last two, the nearsighted man and the poet. As in uh, all fabulous imaginations, there is an attempt to create some kind of uh, definition of what human life is like. For, for Calvino, it is a, an adventure. And it, it becomes increasingly clear as we read through the eight adventures uh, that uh, no matter what the uh, noun connected with the with, with who has the, with with the, with who has the adventure uh, it is it, it ultimately becomes quite clear that um, all of the adventures are uh, in in some sense these what he calls difficult loves and uh, they are going to be uh, they're going to be worked through as something rather systematic. And the idea that the difficult loves are a part of the human system uh, or the system of being human is uh, ultimately the I think the, what, what we are supposed to, to, to find uh, absolutely necessary. In, in Calvino's work. He died in 1985 uh, after 13 days of suffering a stroke. Weaver says that from 1966 until his death, there was no time that he was not translating or supposed to be translating something by Calvino. Sometimes he would call Calvino up 
and ask him to translate a few pages of a text uh, at top speed. Uh, they needed a statement for Canadian television or uh, a little introduction to a book or uh, so forth. He uh, liked strange assignments and uh, he would accept them easily and then the translator was uh, stuck. Uh, There were no accidents in the work. No, uh, there was no sense of uh, uh, free impulses. Uh, every word with Calvino had to be weighed uh, and uh, Bill Weaver says that when I was translating Invisible Cities, my weekend guests in the country were always made to listen to a city or two read aloud because I was unsure of what, what he was doing. And uh, I, I was frequently baffled, but, but Calvino was not baffled ever. And, uh, Sometimes he would, the, the translator says, uh, Calvino's English was more theoretical than idiomatic. He had a way of falling in love with a foreign word with Mr. Palomar, which is some people's favorite. Uh, he developed a crush on the word feedback. He kept inserting it in the text, and uh, Mr. Weaver kept tactfully removing it. <laughs> he said, I could not make it clear to him that like the words charisma and the word input and the word or the expression bottom line, feedback, however beautiful it may sound to the Italian ear, was not appropriate in an English language literary work. <laughs> Apparently he was not a talkative fellow. Uh, never particularly sociable. He tended to see uh, the same old friends, some of them associates uh, from his early days in publishing for Einaudi, um, for whom he worked for years and years. Um, and Bill Weaver says that though they knew each other for 20 years, went to each other's houses, worked together, they were never intimates, never confidants, and indeed, uh, until the early 1980s, they addressed each other with the formal lay. I called him Signor Calvino, and he called me Weaver, unaware how Weaver hated being addressed by his surname. A reminder of uh, prep school days. Even after we were on first name terms, when he telephoned, uh, I could sense a pause before he would say, Bill, he was dying to call me Weaver. <laughs> Weaver says that he doesn't wish to give the impression that Calvino couldn't be friendly Along with his silences, he says, I remember his laughter, often sparked by some event in our work together. And I remember a present he gave me, an elegant little publication about a 
recently restored painting by Lorenzo Lotto of St. Jerome. Inside it, Jerome uh, Calvino had written for Bill, the translator as saint. The most successful and the most striking, I think, of the difficult loves um, come as as we get down to the through the the uh, the series: soldier, bather, clerk, photographer, to the the traveler and the reader. And I want to go through with some attention to the reader and, and then the, the poet. The coast road ran high above the cape, the sea was below, a sheer drop, and on all sides as far as, as the hazy, mountainous horizon. The sun was on all sides too, as if the sky and the sea were two glasses magnifying it. Down below, against the jagged, irregular rocks of the Cape, the calm water slapped without making foam. Amadea, Amadeo Oliva climbed down a steep flight of steps, shouldering his bicycle which he then left in a shady place after closing the padlock. He continued down the steps amid spills of dry yellow earth and agaves jut jutting into the void. And he was real already looking around for the most comfortable stretch of rock to lie down. Under his arm, he had a rolled up towel and inside the towel, his bathing trunks and a book. Uh, this is going to be the adventure of a reader, and it takes, I think, uh, three and a half pages before we open the little cove of greenish-blue water, transparent almost to the bottom. The rocks, according to their exposure, were bleached white or covered with algae. A little pebble beach was at their foot. Every now and then, Amadeo raised his eyes to that broad view, lingered on a glinting of the surface on the oblique dash of a crab, and then he went back, gripped to the page where Raskolnikov counted the steps that separated him from the old woman's door, or where Lucien de Rubempre, before sticking his head into the noose, gazed at the towers and the roofs of the conciergerie. For some time, Amadeo had tended to reduce his participation in active life to the minimum. Not that he didn't like action. On the contrary, love of action nourished his whole character, all his tastes. And yet, yet from one year to the next, the yearning to be, to be someone who did things declined, declined until he wondered if he had really ever really harbored that yearning. His interest in action survived, however, in his pleasure in reading. His passion was always the narration of events, the stories, the tangle of human situations. 19th century novels especially 
but also memoirs and biographies and so on, down to thrillers and science fiction, which he didn't disdain, but which gave him less satisfaction because they were short. Amadeo loved thick tomes, and in tackling them, he felt the physical pleasure of undertaking a great task. Weighing them in his hand, thick, closely printed, squat, he would consider with some apprehension the number of pages, the length of the chapters, and then venture into them. The bit reluctant at the beginning without any desire to perform the initial chore of remembering the names, catching the drift of the story, and then he would entrust himself to it, running along the lines, crossing the grid of the uniform page, and beyond the leaden print, the flame and fire of battle appeared. The cannonball that whistling through the sky fell at the feet of Prince Andre, and the shop filled with engravings and statues where Frédéric Moreau, his heart in his mouth, was to meet the Arnoux family. Beyond the surface of the page, you entered a world where life was more alive than here on this side, like the surface of the water that separates us from that blue and green world, rifts as far as the eye can see, expanses of fine ribbed sand, creatures half animal and half vegetable. And then this continues for many pages of just the, the natural history of Amadeo reading. He was not, however, a hasty, voracious reader. He had reached the age when reading a book for the second, third, or fourth time, he's, he, he's gone through most of French literature at this point, affords more pleasure than a first reading. And yet he still had many continents to discover. Every summer, the most laborious packing before his departure for the sea involved the heavy suitcase to be filled with books. Following the whims and dictates of the month of city life, each year Amadeo would choose certain famous books to reread and certain authors to essay for the first time. And there, on the rock, he went through them, lingering over sentences, often raising his eyes from the page to ponder, to collect his thoughts. At a certain point, raising his eyes in this way, he saw that on the little pebble beach below, in the cove, a woman had appeared and was lying there. She was deeply tanned, thin, not very young or particularly beautiful, but nakedness became her. She wore a very tiny two-piece, rolled up at the edges to get as much sun as she could, and Amadeo's eye was drawn to her. He realized as he read that he was raising his eyes more and more often from the book to gaze into the air, and this air was the air that lay between that woman and himself. Her face, she was stretched out on the sloping shore on a rubber mattress, and at every flicker of his pupils, Amadeo saw her legs, not shapely but harmonious, the excellent smooth belly, the bosom slim in a perhaps not unpleasant way, probably sagging a little, the shoulders a bit too bony, and then the neck and the arms and the face masked by the sunglasses and by the brim of the straw hat was slightly lined, lively, aware, and ironic. Amadeo classified the type independent woman on holiday by herself who dislikes crowded beaches and prefers the more deserted rocks and likes to lie there and become black as coal he evaluated the amount of lazy sensuality and of chronic frustration there was in her. He thought fleetingly of the likelihood of a rapidly consummated fling, measured it against the prospect of a trite conversation, 
a program for the evening, probable logistic difficulties, the effort of concentration always required to become acquainted, even superficially, with a person. And he went on reading, convinced that this woman couldn't interest him at all. This goes on until four or five pages later. The tanned lady from her mattress gave him a smile and a wave. He replied also with a smile and a vague gesture and immediately lowered his eyes. But the lady had said something. Uh, you're reading. Do you read all the time? Mm -hmm. Interesting? Yes. Uh, enjoy yourself. Thank you. He mustn't raise his eyes again, at least not till the end of the chapter. Well, he read that in a flash. The lady now had, anyway, had a cigarette in her mouth and motioned to him as she pointed to it. Amadeo had the impression that for some time she had been trying to attract his attention. I, I beg your pardon. Match. Forgive me. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. I don't, I don't smoke. The chapter was finished. Amadeo rapidly read the first lines of the next, which he found surprisingly attractive. But to begin the next chapter without anxiety, he had to resolve as quickly as possible in the matter of the match. Wait, he stood up, began leaping about among the rocks, half dazed by the sun, till he found a little group of people smoking. He borrowed a box of matches, ran to the lady, lighted her cigarette, ran back to return the matches. They said to him, keep them, you keep them. He ran again to the lady to leave the matches with her, and she thanked him. He waited a moment before leaving her, but realized that after the delay, well, he had to say something. And so he said, you aren't swimming. In a little while, the lady said, what about you? Oh, I've already had my swim. And you're not going to take another dip? Well, well yes, I'll, I'll read one more chapter and then I'll have a swim again. Oh, me too, when I finish my cigarette, I'll dive in. See you later then. Later. Now this kind of appointment restored to Amadeo a calm such as he had, now he realized, not known since the moment he became aware of the solitary lady. Now his conscience was no longer oppressed by the thought of having to have any sort of relationship with that lady. Everything was postponed to the moment of their swim, a swim he would have taken anyway, even if the lady hadn't been there, and for now, he could abandon himself without remorse to the pleasure of reading so thoroughly that he didn't notice when at a certain point, before he had reached the end of the chapter, the lady finished her cigarette, stood up, and approached him to invite him to go swimming. He saw the clogs and the straight legs just beyond the book his eyes moved up, he lowered them again to the page. The sun was dazzling and read a few lines in haste. Looked up again, heard her say, isn't your head about to explode? I'm going to have a dip. It was nice to stay there, to go on reading and to look up everyone now and then. But since he could no longer put it off, Amadeo did something he never did, he skipped almost half a page to the conclusion of the chapter, which he read, on the other hand, with great attention. And then he stood up. <gasps> well, let's go. Shall we dive from the, from the point there? And then that becomes a discussion. Goes on for some time. Amadeo was forced to raise his head from the book 
The woman was looking at him and her eyes were bitter. Is something wrong? He asked. Don't you ever get tired of reading? She asked. You could hardly be called good company. Don't you know that with women you're supposed to make conversation? She added. Her half smile was perhaps meant only to be ironic. Though to Amadeo, who at that moment would have paid anything rather than give up his novel, it seemed downright threatening. What have I got myself into moving down here, he thought. Now it was clear that with this woman beside him, he wouldn't read a line. I must make her realize she's made a mistake, and so forth. And then I just will read you the end of the adventure. The sun was gradually setting beside, behind the, the next promontory, and the, then the next, and then one after that, leaving remnants of color against the light. From the little coves of the Cape, all the bathers had gone. Now the two of them were alone. Amadeo had his arm around the woman's shoulders. He was reading. He gave her kisses on the neck and on the ears, which it seemed to be him she liked. And every now and then when she turned, on the mouth. And then he resumed reading. Perhaps this time he found the idea, ideal equilibrium. He could go on like this for a hundred pages or so. But once again, it was she who wanted to change the situation. She began to stiffen, almost to reject him, and then she said, oh, it's late, let's go, I'm, I'm going to dress. This abrupt decision opened up quite different prospects. Amadeo was a bit disoriented, but he didn't stop to weigh the pros and cons. He had reached a climax in the book, and her dimly heard words, I'm going to dress, had in his mind immediately been translated into these others. While she dresses, I'll have time to read a few pages without being disturbed. But she said, hold up the towel, please, addressing him as two for perhaps the first time. I don't want anyone to see me. This precaution was useless because the shore by now was deserted, but Amadeo continued, consented amiably, amiably, since he could hold up the towel while remaining seated and so continue to read the book on his knees. On the other hand, uh, on the other side of the towel, the lady had undone her halter paying no attention to whether he was looking at her or not. Amadeo didn't know whether to look at her, pretending to read, or to read, pretending to look at her. He was interested in the one thing and the other, but looking at her seemed too indiscreet while going on reading seemed too indifferent. The lady did not follow the usual method used by bathers who dress outdoors, first putting on clothes, then removing the bathing suit underneath. No, now that her bosom was bared, she took off the bottom of her suit too. Uh, this was when, for the first time, she turned her face toward him, and it was a sad face with a bitter curl to her mouth, and she shook her head, shook her head, and looked at him. Oh, since it has to happen, it might as well happen immediately, Amadeo thought, diving forward, book in hand, one finger between the pages. But what he read in that gaze, reproach, commiseration, dejection, as if to say, stupid, all right, we'll do it as if it has to be done like this. But if you don't understand a thing any more than the others, or rather, what he did not read, since he didn't know how to read gazes, but only vaguely sensed, roused in him a moment of such transport toward the woman that embracing her and falling onto the mattress with her, he only slightly turned his head toward the book to make sure it hadn't fallen into the sun. It had fallen instead, right beside the mattress, open, but a few pages had flipped over, and Amadeo, even in the ecstasy of his embraces, 
tried to free one hand to put the bookmark at the right page. Nothing is more irritating than when you're eager to resume reading than to have to search through the book unable to find your place. Their lovemaking was a perfect match. It could perhaps have been extended a bit longer. Oh, but then hadn't everything been lightning fast in their encounter? Dusk was falling. Below, the rocks opened out, sloping a little into a little harbor. Now she had gone down there and was halfway into the water. Come down, we'll have a last swim. Amadeo, biting his lip, was counting how many pages were left till the end. That's the adventure of, re of the reader. It's almost, it's only the fifth of eight. And there becomes, the, there's the adventure of a nearsighted man and so forth, and several others. And, but finally, there's the adventure of a poet. And I want to just leave you with some sense of, I think my students who are here uh, will have read this, but in any case, I just want to read the last page. On shore, Another boat had been pulled in, overturned, propped up on sawhorses. And below, from the shadow, emerged the soles of the bare feet of the sleeping men, those who had fished during the night. Nearby, a woman, all in black clothing, faceless, was setting a pot over a seaweed fire. And a long trail of smoke was coming from it. The shore of that cove was of gray stones, Patches of faded printed colors were the smocks of the playing children, the smaller watched over by the older, whining sisters, while the bigger and livelier boys, wearing only shorts made from hand-me-down grown-ups trousers, were rowing, rowing, running up and down between rocks and water. Farther on, a straight stretch of sandy beach began, white and deserted which at one side disappeared into a sparse cane break and until fields, untilled fields. A young man in his Sunday clothes, all black, even his hat, with a stick over his shoulder and a bundle hanging from it, was walking by the sea, the length of that beach, the nails of his shoes marking the friable crust of sand. Certainly a peasant or a shepherd from an island village who had come down to the coast for some market or other and had taken the seaside path for a soothing breeze. The railroad showed its wires, its embankment, its poles and fence, and then vanished into the tunnel to begin again farther on, vanish once more, and once more emerge like stitches in uneven sewing. Above the white and black highway markers, Squat olive groves began to climb, and higher still the mountains were bare, grazing land or shrubs or only stones. A village set in a cliff among those heights extended upward, the houses on one on top of the other, separated by cobbled stair streets, a concave, concave in the middle so that the trickle of mule refuse could flow down. And on the doorstep of all these houses were numerous women, elderly or aged, aged, and on the parapets, seated in a row, numerous men, old and young, all in white shirts, in the middle of those streets, like stairways. The babies were playing on the ground, and an older boy was lying again across the path, his cheek against the steep sorry, against the step, sleeping there because there was a, it was a bit cooler and less smelly than inside the house. And everywhere, lighting or circling, were clouds of flies. And on every wall and every festoon of newspaper around the fireplaces was the infinite spatter of fly excrement. And unto is Nellie's mind, 
came words and words, thick, woven one onto another, with no space between the lines, until little by little they could no longer be distinguished. It was a tangle from which even the tiniest white spaces were vanishing, and only the black remained, the most total black, impenetrable, desperate as a scream. That is the adventure of a poet, or of the poet. And it is, of course, the adventure that sums up each one of those reluctant but necessary distractions. And I, the, whole, the entire little book, which will take you an hour and a half to read, um, maybe two, but is uh, absolutely uh, unforgettable. And if you, if you give yourself those, that moment, you will have, have added to your experience um, one of those um, bits of uh, wisdom uh, that uh, literature affords and that uh, will be uh, yours forever. And I, the, it is very much the, very much the characteristic of uh, Italo Calvino uh, to to work this way. But the annoying, annoying, and extraordinary thing is that he always works this way. This is his procedure, his writing. He does not wish to do it any other way. Uh, it is his. And uh, it is um, one of the uh, delights of modern Italian literature. And uh, it seems to me uh, that it is in all of his works, um, whether it's Invisible Cities or Mr. Palomar or many of the other books, uh, it is always a revelation. And the fact that it's the same revelation is the most uh, sort of a startling thing of all. That, it is always the, the revelation uh, of uh, a human definition uh, of uh, what happens when time passes through the human body. And I, uh, I urge you uh, to uh, have a, a further uh, look at it. to say that when this class proceeded, this, we are now through. We have only one more uh, class to dedicate to uh, a single work by Sylvia Townsend Warner, the uh, recently uh, deceased English author uh, next week, next Tuesday. But, but like, like Sylvia's, uh, Sylvia Warner's books, and like many of the others, including uh, Tolstoy and Jane Austen, uh, the, uh, the texts uh, of the, 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 to be considered are texts of a certain restraint as opposed to texts of a certain, um, I can't remember the word I used that you, 
yes, rhetorical splendor. And uh, uh, it, it is interesting to see that the, these, as we know, tremendous authors uh, were all in the, in the hands of, of this uh, notion that uh, restraint was a, a, a compositional device, uh, perhaps as uh, effective and as compulsory as uh, any, any of the, of the uh, other uh, notions that are so uh, wickedly uh, proposed to us as being uh, the, uh, the starring features of, 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 of great literature. And so we, we have had four, we had 14 of these kinds of uh, effectiveness. And I think uh, Calvino belongs with them and is uh, precisely uh, the kind of uh, emphasis or perhaps lack of emphasis uh, that is uh, required uh, to produce the, uh, the, the, the particular uh, human effect that I'm, I'm trying to uh, indicate as, a, as, my, as my subject. And, uh, you, you come at a particular moment in the entire system, uh, which indeed the system itself comes after uh, 12 or 15 uh, readings of uh, in just exactly uh, literary splendor of, of the other kind. Uh, so that restraint uh, is, uh, now uh, upon us and uh, splendor is a thing of the past. And uh, we'll perhaps uh, next term, we're going to return to uh, a, different, a different series and a different, a different effect. But I, I'll have to keep that for next year. But I, w I wanted to make it clear that wh what, what we were doing here, or what the, the figure that we're talking about is, uh, is part of a, of a set uh, that is uh, a, in a sense a, a, a literary um, device. And, and one sees how many kinds of that device, how many versions of that device can be can be developed or or proceeded with, but I'm I'm uh, I'd like to feel that the, the entirety of the affair is is part of the notion that one has that uh, and you understand that these courses are given to people who wish to be writers, who already are writers. And uh, uh, it is apparent, it becomes apparent to all of us uh, that literature is a, a structure. With, uh, and part of that structure is indeed connected to the alternations, perhaps one could call them, of splendor and restraint, um, but these are all parts of the containing um, stratagems of literature, and they keep us uh, alive in a very special and uh, uh, 
secret way, some of the secrets I am able to reveal. If I had another few weeks, I could do it better. But in any case, that's, that was a, a sample. And we'll, we'll, we'll do others. And, and, and some of my students have, who, who are there, uh, they're here for a two-year series, apparently. Uh, and uh, they, they come for two years, and uh, some of them, some of my friends out there, come m more often. And we, we, we learn more about the structure of literature, about the, uh, what it contains, what it rejects. And uh, it's, it's really what I'm at Columbia for. And I'm happy to s provide a, a little sense of what that would be for, for you if you were to come every week. Thank you again. <laughs> were, there, were there questions about Mr. Uh, about, about Italo Calvino himself or, or about anything that I didn't guess? The flies. And is, it, is that sort of autobiographical? Is it such a common theme in his writing? Uh, no, I, I think it's what it is. Is a, it's yet another uh, figuration, um, which is entirely literary or uh, imaginary, and uh, uh, that uh, is left completely. Uh, imagine, I mean, it's left imaginary. It's, it's not to be, uh, it, is this what you mean? You know, it, that, that, it, it, that's not to be answered. And, and that, those, that last, those last words were, were so extraordinary. That black. Only black remained, the most total black, impenetrable, desperate as a scream. And, and one must, you know, contend with that. One is, one is in, in some kind of maybe prison, bondage, something. Maybe not, maybe it's not, maybe it's release. But I mean, it's, it's not clear, and it won't ever be clear. But that's the adventure of a poet. The other poets don't, the other, <laughs> the other, <laughs> the other figures do not represent um, experience in quite that desperate a way. And, and we see that the, the, the series moves forward into this last black thing with, without an answer. But fortunately, he had another book to write and, and another. Yes.
<laughs> no, but I, uh, but nonetheless, I, I'm, I'm charmed by the notion <laughs> one could have that power. No, I don't think it's up to the translator, but it's just, I mention it as something that is, is for me at least, uh, a, a constant effect and uh, one that I, I am aware of because because I practice it myself and because I'm a reader as well as a translator. But I don't, I don't think I, I would say, I, I would attribute those powers to the translator. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, is, I feel that Bill Weaver's uh, insistence that we remove uh, those six or seven words that he found uh, appalling uh, is, is a little bit, uh, it's, a rev it's, a, it's a revelation of something that's a little uh, dubious. You're right. But we, it seems to me that even that is, a, is part of the part of the necessity of the, of the or the ambiguity of literature. Yeah. No other. Okay. Next time.